To let go frees you up to hold on to something else. We all have some things in our lives that God is calling us to hold on to more firmly than ever before. Some of these are ideas, some of these are people, some of these are habits, some rhythms, some relationships. There are other things that some of them are wrong and some of them aren't wrong. They just aren't the ultimate things for God. And so one more time this morning, brothers and sisters, we're going to walk through and ask God to show us what are some things he wants us to hold on to more tightly, to grasp more firmly, maybe for the first time, maybe for the umpteenth time. And what are some things that he's going to show each one of us to, to let go of, maybe for a season, maybe forever, but to finally free up our hands, free up our minutes, free up our hearts, free up our emotional capacity so that we actually can hold on to him and to each other and to whatever else he's calling us to hold on to better. These days, the idea of following somebody is such a big deal. Uh, you follow people online, you follow people on several different apps, um, and and. We, some of us, we really struggle. We want to find um, some sort of a sense of belonging or a sense of self-worth in that other people follow us. Uh, you get on your app, whatever it is, Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is that's your, your app, and you go, wow, if only I could have as many followers as that person. Or, 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 or if you go, wow, why do I only have so many followers? Or... or we have all these ideas, or, or we talk about, we make friends. Do you follow so-and-so? Do you listen to this podcast? Do you watch this preacher on YouTube? Do you listen to, how many, how many know what I'm talking about? Am I, am I the only person that, okay, that's what I thought. It's just how it is. We didn't invent this. This is not 2024 America. It's not the first time that popularity has been something that calls to the heart of human beings. This just happens to be one of the really obvious ways that we struggle with it today. But here's where we're going to start today. Here's where we're going to go the whole time. As Christians, we don't chase popularity. We don't chase what we're, we, we don't do what we're doing here hoping that we can stay just hip enough, just current enough, just relevant enough, just good enough that somebody's going to show up here and worship with us. Here's, here's what it is. We follow Jesus. That's it. If you're somebody who's writing words down, the first word you're going to write down today is simply the word follow. And I don't mean we follow him on Facebook. I don't mean we follow him as in we listen to some things he says sometimes or we tell some people, hey, you should check that Jesus guy out sometime. I mean, this is what we do. This is who we are. Would you say it out loud with me this morning? We follow Jesus. It's a very clear image. It's kind of like these things lined up here in front of me. If, if these were alive and this was the leader, the little motorcycle, everything would be follow wherever this goes. Anybody ever play follow the leader as a kid? Whatever the leader is. That's the idea of follow here. When we follow Jesus, suddenly there's this moment where we choose to follow him, but that's only the beginning. What happens when we really follow Jesus is that our relationships, our rhythms, our routines, they start to revolve around Jesus and his purposes. What we do each day, what we do each week, what we do each year, what we do over and over again, how we do those things. They're constantly seeking Jesus. What's he want in this? And how does this serve Jesus? How does this further his purposes on the earth. And little by little, that becomes our deepest, most defining purpose. And it happens by doing it every single day. Some days that's going to make us popular. Some days somebody's going to go, wow, that's really cool. Other days they're going to go, you follow Jesus? Not okay with that. Doesn't matter. That's who we are. That's what we do. The early church, the prototype church that we looked at last week in Acts chapter 2, we look at often, we're looking at again today. This is, watch how everything about how they lived revolved around Jesus. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. 
And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And that word favor, especially in the biblical sense, is, it's similar to popularity, but it's profoundly different. And that's what we're really going to explore today. Both of them, at any given moment, you're going to see somebody speaking positively about you. If you're popular, people are going to say good things about you, at least for a season. If you have favor, people are in the community. People are going to say some good things about you online nowadays or in person. There's, there's some commonality there. But that's really the only place where they're the same. Because popularity, seeking popularity, is all about your reputation. It's not who you really are. It's what people think about you. And how many know that's not always the same thing? How many know that a lot of times people, what they think about us is way too generous. And a lot of times what they think about us is way too cruel and completely off base. But our reputation is what people think of us. But favor has to do with our identity, who we actually are. Popularity has to do with conversation. It has to do with what people talk about. They, they talk about it. Maybe it's on a podcast. Maybe it's online. Maybe they're commenting. But it's things that people say. Favor has more to do, especially in the scriptural sense. It has to do with what we actually do. If we have favor with people, we're probably going to inspire them to try to be better people themselves. It's not that they're just going to talk about us all the time and how great we are. They're going to go, man, if that guy can do it, if she can do it, I bet I could. That's, that's where favor leads. It's not about us at all. And the same thing, a lot of times popularity is more a distraction. It's something to talk about so you don't have to talk about whatever other things people might want to talk about about you. Sorry, about you or about what's happening in life. Instead, let's talk about this thing that's popular. Have you seen this viral video? Have you seen this meme? Have you seen this? Have you heard this? What do you think about this thing that just happened? It's, it's popular, but it's really a distraction from the things that matter. But favor has more to do with the courage to keep doing the right thing, to make sure that our rhythms revolve around Jesus and his purposes. That's, that's what we mean by following Jesus. And this idea throughout scripture of following God, of following Jesus, uh, one of the common images is the good shepherd. And most famously, Old Testament, Psalm 23. Most famously, New Testament, John chapter 10. Both have this idea of us being a flock of sheep following a wise and providing shepherd. And because we are his sheep, we belong to him. And because he is a good shepherd, we have guidance. We have protection. We have a sense of intimacy with him. We're, we're actually literally following him. We recognize his voice. We have a sense of community with all the other people who are also following the same good shepherd. We have wisdom about where to go and where to find the good stuff in life. Not because we individually or even collectively are so wise, but because our shepherd is. And we know that our shepherd is willing to sacrifice himself for us. One thing we don't talk about as much as sheep are ultimately usually raised for sacrifice as well. To be part of the flock of Jesus is to be called to love one another the way he loved us, which means we laid our lives down to serve one another. Sheep are raised for their fleece and for, as food, right? And we love the idea of being the cute little lamb that the shepherd is carrying around or all the cute little sheep following the shepherd around. We always have all that we need, but ultimately the sheep are heading somewhere. <laughs> Think about that for a second. But that's why we learn to trust our shepherd. Know that he's good even when it doesn't feel that way to us. Psalm 37, 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Which is why it's so important that we learn to know his voice. If you're at one of the two adventure weeks of camp, 
Some of what I'm about to say I hope will sound very familiar. The rest of you, I hope it's also familiar, but please hear me if you've heard this a thousand times or whenever. It is so crucial, brothers and sisters, that we all learn to know the voice of God. We've got to. We're missing the whole thing if we don't know God's voice. And it's going to be a little bit different for each one of us. So even in the scriptures, it's different. Only Moses got to he hear God's voice coming out of a burning bush. Did you ever notice that? There's not a burning bush every time. There's all these different ways that God interacts with people, even in the scriptures themselves. And today, I know people that tell me that they hear God speaking to them just like it's a conversation, and I believe them. And I hear people that say they've never actually heard words at all, but God just convinces them, somehow gives them a feeling or a clear sense that this is what they're supposed to do. I know people that when they read the scriptures, they're just looking at the page it's just, it's like God is speaking directly to them. I know other people that it, the Bible feels more like a textbook, but then when they pray, they have the voice of God. I, I, I could go on and on, but God, it's okay. Hear me on this. It's okay if God speaks to you a little differently than he speaks to the person next to you. But you've got to know the voice of God. You've got to do whatever it is that helps you hear him best, and you've got to do that often. You've got to give him a chance to speak. And here's a couple of pointers that I've learned just across the board that help me hear his voice and I think will help all of us. One is, his voice will never contradict scripture. One of the best ways to always hear the voice of God, even if it's not in an overwhelming, like so awe-inspiring, oh, I sense his presence. I, it's so real in the room. Maybe it's not like that every single day, but you're always gonna hear his voice when you read scripture. Maybe you listen to it on an audio book. Maybe, maybe there's other ways to interact with it, but you've got to hear scripture. And his voice will never contradict scripture. Whatever other voice you're hearing in your head is not him if it contradicts scripture. But give him a chance to speak to you through prayer. Give him a chance to speak to you by confirming things. You're, how many have ever had that happen where you're praying about something and the song on the radio and the thing you just happened over here and the book you just read and what came on on TV, somehow or another, you're just hearing the same thing over and over. Has this happened to a lot of you? Okay, that's what I thought. It doesn't happen to everybody, but that's one of the ways. Again, whether it's wisdom or prayer or Bible study or conviction or whatever it is, you've got to seek You've got to anticipate, you've got to learn to hear God's voice so that when he calls you, when he directs you, you can listen. That's what Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. That was what allows us to follow fearlessly. Again, if you're writing down words, that's the next word. I'd love for you to write that one down, make it stick in your brain. We're gonna say it out loud in a second. First, I wanna clarify, it doesn't mean that we don't feel fear. It means that we fear God more than we fear anything else. It's not that we have no fear. It, to act fearlessly, to follow fearlessly means we do what needs to be done regardless of if we feel fear or not. It's more like, Courage. In this sense, when we say we follow fearlessly, it, it's more like courage. Let's say this together. We follow fearlessly. Jesus said the truth can set us free. And so can just knowing what's real, knowing what's true, and knowing that we get it done regardless. In John 8, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Again, it's not just enough to know what he said. It's not enough to be able to discuss it. It's not enough to be able to hear somebody proclaim it. It's not enough to be able to, to talk about it in a small group or to be able to journal about it or even to be able to post about it yourself or tell other people about it or teach other people about it. To follow means you actually do something. You actually get it done. Jesus says those who actually obey his commandments are his followers, 
his disciples, the ones who actually hear his voice and do what he tells us to do. And when that happens, life just looks differently. The psalmist writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I see everything by this light that God gives me. I'm saved from this constant craving for popularity among many other things because what I really want is God's favor. And if I ever get favor from people, it's because they respect that I actually am just really truly trying to follow God. I am who I say I am. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against the, to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Notice he doesn't say if, but when. Though an army besiege me. In other words, Every time that happens too. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. We're following not so much in the absence of fear, but fearing missing God's will for us more than we fear missing out on something God forbids. Fearing missing out on knowing God himself more than we fear other people judging us for being such a radical Christian. To live fearlessly is to fear God more than we fear anything else in every sense of that word. The psalmist also writes, when I am afraid, when I am afraid, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, in whose word I praise. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? The prophet Isaiah writes, behold, God is my salvation. I, I love that word, behold. We don't have an exact equivalent in English. So we, we, I don't hear a lot of people saying, Behold, very often anymore, unless we're watching Shakespeare or something like that. But it, it, it kind of means like when a kid goes, hey, watch. Anybody of that? Hang out with a kid, they're gonna, you're going to hear it like every time you're with them. Hey, watch this. Or as they say in Tennessee, hold my beer. <laughs> That's the equivalent. <laughs> watch this. Look at this. Pay attention. You're going to see something cool. This next thing, watch this next thing. That's what behold means. And Isaiah says, watch, watch. God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. I think it's really interesting that sometimes Jesus himself leads us into situations that are really scary. Notice how this very famous story begins. And then listen again, pretend you'd never heard it before. Just listen to this amazing story from Matthew 8. Then he, that's Jesus, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. We've all been in that boat. Sometimes we put ourselves in a scary situation and then we wonder why Jesus is asleep. But sometimes it's right in the middle. Often it's right in the middle of doing exactly what he told us to do. That we have that feeling that he's, he's kind of checked out for a second. We're not hearing his voice. We're not seeing him do miracles. We're not feeling the feelings. 
if, you're, if that's where you are right now, it's, it's not okay to stay there, but it's okay that you're there right this second. That's part of the journey. That's part of what it feels like to follow him. The trick is that we keep following fearlessly, that even in those moments we keep following, that when we think he's asleep, that's when we go to him and say, hey, hey, I'm about to drown here. Please talk to me. And that's when he shows up and he does something. That's when he shows up and does something you couldn't expect. That's when he shows up and does something that you're just like, wait a minute, that's bigger than I imagined. That's more than I know. Who can do that? Matthew 10, 28, Jesus himself said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, it's this concept of fearing God more than we fear even death itself, more than we fear anything that we see as a threat, more than not being popular, more than anything that we might want to avoid. And when this happens, when we follow him and we experience this favor with God, we experience what this, what, what this looks like, we, it, it, we don't have to imagine anymore. We don't have to hope that there really is a God. We don't have to just believe I think he really is there. Look at all these cool points I've got. We actually experience him. And on the other side of that, he also experiences something with us. I love God's relationship with Abraham because if anybody ever messed up a lot of stuff, it was Abraham. And yet little by little, he gets a little bit more faith and a little bit more faith until by the end when God says the most outlandish thing he ever said to him, which was to sacrifice his own son as an offering. Goes against everything Abraham knew about God and his character. It goes against everything that Abraham wanted. It goes against everything God had promised to Abraham, everything that God had fixed and corrected when Abraham rushed ahead. It goes against everything he knew. But by this point in his life, hear me, Abraham knew the voice of God. And at this point, he was willing to trust it to do what God said no matter what. And that's why God himself got a view of Abraham that had shifted as well. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Paul writes, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are, not our reputation, not what people think we are, not what our posts or likes or comments or whatever else online say about us, not what our online bios say about us, what we are, our true identity, what we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. That's this concept of favor with God and favor with man or mankind. So here's the other way we follow. We follow faithfully. And the third word you're going to write down today if you're actually taking notes, and I'd love for you to say it with me one more time. We follow faithfully. We keep following. We stay at it. We keep making the rhythms and the relationships of our life revolve around Jesus and his purposes. And when this happens, we experience his presence. Now, again, let's not misunderstand this idea of following Jesus and finding favor with Jesus, that that means that nothing bad can ever possibly happen. The first time that we see this concept is in Genesis chapter four, verse four. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, which is why Cain got jealous, which is why Cain killed Abel. God has favor on Abel. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to live a long life. He has favor with Abel. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be rich and famous and have more likes than Mr. Beast. Thank you, the 
people who actually know who that is. I barely do, to be totally honest. I just knew he's the most popular YouTuber, if you don't know who that is. Let's try this again. Second time you see the idea of favor in the scripture is Genesis 6, 8. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah doesn't just instantly get this cushy life either. He gets a huge job. He gets to spend on about a century building a massive boat and collecting animals and enduring a flood and rebuilding the world when it was all over. And he wasn't popular. The only people that actually listened to his message at all were his own immediate family. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they weren't that happy with him many of those days. But he followed faithfully and God was pleased. The idea of favor has eternal consequences. And sometimes it has good consequences in the moment. Psalm 30 verse 5. For his anger, God's anger lasts only a moment. But his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Again, it's eternal consequences. It's something that is bigger than life, but we start to experience it here and now. The writer of Proverbs says, my son, do not forget my teaching. Keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and then you will find favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. In other words, these tips I'm going to give you in this book called Proverbs, they're going to, they're, it's kind of a reap what you sow. This is how things normally work. I'd like you to, these are wise, good things to remember. But the most important thing is let love and faithfulness be at the core. Love for God, love for other people. Just right there in there, just like your heart beats. That's where you're going to find favor with God. And maybe a good name with other people. In Isaiah 61, uh, Isaiah has this really cool passage about the year of Jubilee, the year that he calls the year of God's favor. When God reminds him that, hey, I know that all that land has belonged to you and your family for about 50 years now. It really belongs to me. So just give it all back to the original owners. I know those people have been your employees and all that. For, let, let them free. I know those people owe you money. Cancel all the debts. It really, this, all this stuff that you guys stress about is so much bigger than your lifetime. Let's remember that together in the year of Jubilee. And I'm not sure even Isaiah realized that that was also a messianic passage, but we'll get there in a second. Here's some more favor passages. First Samuel, the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Why? Because everybody knew that Eli, the priest that he was serving as a kid, was corrupt and his kids were even more corrupt. But they knew there was something real about this Samuel. They didn't always follow him. They didn't always obey him. They didn't always agree with him. But they were like, yeah, but he's the real deal. He really does follow God. We see the same thing in the New Testament, Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. But the day in Luke 4, when Jesus stands up and reads that passage from Isaiah 61, he goes, today, this thing about the Lord's favor coming upon you, that's fulfilled in your presence because it's really about me. Do you know what happened next? They tried to kill him. And he didn't die that day. So is that me? Is that how we know God's favor is on him? No. The way we know is that he eventually did die and he did set the captives free, just like that passage said he would. And then God brought him back to life and now he's the king of kings and lord of lords because his favor is bigger than the circumstances. It's bigger than the here and now. It's bigger than all the stuff that we fear the most. It's bigger than what people think about us. It's bigger than who we even really are at any given moment. It's bigger than all of that. It has to do with who God really is, who we really are. And when we fully surrender to him, when we follow him, 
And when we follow him fearlessly and faithfully, when everything about us, our relationships and our rhythms revolve around Jesus, we actually little by little do become like him. That's what favor is about. It's so much better than popularity. I'm not sure why we want it so bad. I'm not sure why it matters so much. There's some middle schoolers in the room. Guys, if you guys just only knew how little all those middle school people that you're so worried about what they think about you, how little that's going to matter a couple years from now. All you high schoolers, all you college students, the people you're so desperate to impress, they barely even know your name. And they're not going to know your name years from now. And all you people that are a little bit older than that, same thing. All of the stress that we feel, all trying to be this or that or please these people or please those people or at least not tick those people off too badly. If that's what our lives revolve around, it's just we're never going to really be free at all. The only thing that sets us free is the truth and letting our lives revolve around that. James writes, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Don't, don't mistake this, that we are not friendly to the world. It means when you put what the world thinks higher on your list than what God thinks. That's what it's talking about. When you care more about being politically correct or whatever other kind of correct there may be than you care about finding favor with God, that actually cuts you off from God. God wants to be first. And if anything else ever lines up with what God says, then cool, it's fair game. But it's gotta be God first. You adulterous people, don't you know friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. And that is why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a situation where I'm opposing God. It's, it's one thing to maybe not be exactly where I need to be with him, but knowing I am in a situation where he's opposing me, guess who's going to win that arm wrestling match? God every time. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. The people go, I, God, you're God, and I'm not. Okay, I trust you. I know I can't speak to the wind and the waves and make them stop. You can if you want to. I'm asking, please. That's when he, we see something happen. James continues, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You're the shepherd, we are the sheep. You are the Lord, we are your people. That's what it means. We're defined by the idea that we follow Jesus, we follow him fearlessly, we follow him faithfully. And when that happens, here's those three items of favor one more time. And as we go through this one last time, I hope and pray that again, you will think of something. You will ask and hear the voice of God. If you don't hear it right now, come back to it later on today or later on this week until he gives you something. Because I want you to have something. I've been praying for each one of you that he will give you something. Something to let go of so you can hold on more tightly. Something you need to hold on more tightly to. In the sense of identity. It's that voice of God more than anything else. What do you need to let go of so you have more time to pursue God himself and get to know his voice? On a regular, daily basis, you hear from God somehow. 
It doesn't have to be a sin that you let go. It doesn't have to be something bad. It's just somehow that gets done, but you don't have time to do that thing that always helps you connect with God. What can you let go so that you can practice hearing the voice of God more? In the, in the category of inspiration, where when we live this way, other people are inspired to live differently. Not just talk about us, not just put up little cool emojis about us, but actually live differently themselves. I promise you that's going to come to sacrifice. It's going to come to something that you're willing to just, no matter what kind of prayers, no matter what kind of situations, be willing to sacrifice anything to do what's right. And the idea of courage, there's going to be a lot of waiting. There's going to be a lot of acting. There's going to be a lot of not being popular, but that's okay. Because what we're after is God's favor. And if we ever get favor with people as well, it needs to be because they get how good we are. I'd like the band to come on back up as we wrap up here. One last thing, the Olympics are starting to gear up. We're starting to go there one more time. I am always fascinated by how when we watch the Olympics that we get into sports that we're never into at other times. You know what I'm saying? Like curling. <laughs> but what's inspiring about it is not so much how cool that game is, but there's these people, they've spent at least four years practicing all the time. And there's something really inspiring to watch somebody do something with passion and do it with excellence, do it well. And we have favor for those people, even if we don't say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a curler. We can go, wow, look at them go. My prayer for all of us this morning, and I believe it's what's God's heart for us is this, is even if nobody ever respects us as individuals or as a church, that they'll be able to tell, you know what? They really do follow Jesus though. They really do follow him. That's who they are. They follow fearlessly. They follow faithfully. You gotta at least respect that. That's the only kind of favor I want from people. Whatever God's telling you, would you do it this morning?